Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, this is Mr. Miller once again. Uh, this is a video, this is going to be a bit of a longer video for the 26th of May, Tuesday, May 26th. So, uh, we had Memorial Day this past weekend. Hopefully everybody enjoyed the time off uh, and away from your computer maybe. Uh, but also hopefully you spent some time with your family, but also remembered what Memorial Day is all about. Uh, which would be our soldiers who have died in our, um, I guess, in fighting for our country. So uh, that is uh, what we did this past weekend. So I did, as you see on the sign up there, I got a little sunburned on Saturday, but I have uh, mostly survived. Uh, it was uh, hurting a little bit on Sunday. Monday, not so bad. So I'm okay. Uh, I will survive and I'll be okay. Um, yeah, so that's that. We are entering week 11. Uh, we are 10, or we are, yeah, 10 weeks to the day uh, from uh, today, or no, 10 weeks to the day from yesterday. I messed up this number here. This should be 71, actually, because uh, 70, 70 was yesterday on Monday. Um, so we started this whole experience on, on the Tuesday. So this would have been 10 weeks ago today we started. So that makes this week, week 11. So uh, it's been a long time uh, since I've seen most of you guys. So uh, that is uh, sad, obviously, but we are almost done. So we will finish strongly and uh, be done with this and then hopefully get back to some level of normal next year where we can see each other again. So we, uh, I guess at this point, just some housekeeping stuff. We have uh, one week until uh, I absolutely positively need to have all the work from uh, marking period five in. Uh, I have to send Mrs. Taylor any grade updates by June 1st, which is next Monday. So we are at six days away from the final day that you can get anything to me to get me to update those grades. Okay, I absolutely need that stuff. And I'm not talking like midnight on June 1st. Okay, I'm talking like I need it probably by the end of May 31st so then I can get the grades turned around by June 1st and sent to Mrs. Taylor because I'm going to be busy that day, I am assuming, based on all the grades that may or may not be coming into me. So get those things to me as soon as you can. Do not wait uh, I will get to them as soon as possible, and as long as they're into me, uh, I will get them in. But if they are turned in at some point on that June 1st, I'm not going to make any promises about that because I might have other grades that I'm kind of working on at that point. So if you have a question about what you may owe from marking period 5, uh, we've been out of marking period 5 at this point for, for three weeks. Uh, so you should uh, should have gotten your report cards, and anybody with an incomplete means that I didn't have enough work to be able to pass you. So you need to get work to me and send that work in. But again, if you are at an incomplete, you are probably not watching this video right now, which is sad. Uh, if you know somebody who is not watching these videos, uh, yell at them, okay? Because you can yell at them, I can't, because I don't see them and I don't hear from them, uh, and they don't return my emails. So it's it's quite a conundrum here. Uh, but it is not helpful uh, to them or to me uh, to have to try to track them down in this way. Uh, also, we are going to be at about three more weeks, counting this week, three more weeks, and then we're going to be done. Uh, our target end date is the 12th of June. Uh, that is going to be kind of the end for this uh, course. Obviously, we don't have a Regents exam, uh, but June 12th is going to be kind of the, the day that we're ending up things, hopefully. Uh, or finished with things. So we've got three weeks. So if you are tired of this, join the club. I am too, but uh, we have to kind of keep going through this. Uh, I think I think the um, I think uh, the the fun thought about having online learning has kind of worn off at this point. And some people really like it. Kudos to you. A lot of people don't. Uh, and I I am probably in that camp where it's okay, but I'd rather be seeing you guys face to face. So we'll get through these next three weeks, and then hopefully uh, hopefully in the fall it's safe enough for us to go back. Um, and I just or we have faith and trust in our leaders that are that are allowing us to do those things or uh, getting us to that point. So today uh, we're going to continue on with uh, topic 19 through 20 notes. 
Uh, so we started that on Thursday. We started, uh, we went through one through three. Uh, again, I had said on Thursday that we're going to go through these things kind of slower. I've got a lot more information to give you uh, because these uh, topics are a little bit deeper. Uh, they are more recent. There's a lot of recent memories about these things. There's a lot of stories that I know that I just don't have about other things. Uh, so I have more information to share with you guys about this. And it's more interesting for a lot of people because it's very, very recent. Uh, we will, by the end of this week, get into talking about um, September 11th. Uh, which is, uh, you know, mo for everybody in this everybody in this class, uh, for the most part, happened either right as you were being born or before you were even born, which is fine. You can't control that. Uh, but September 11th, yeah, I guess it would be everybody was everybody was born before this. Anyways, unless you're 19, almost 19. Uh, if you're 18, maybe, maybe I don't know. But. Uh, it's more recent and it's more aware for a lot of people. A lot of people have an understanding of these things. So it gets interesting in some cases. So we go through it a little bit slower. Uh, so then we can really pull out some of those, uh, some of those things that we have heard of or seen before or uh, are aware of. So uh, without further ado, we're going to jump into uh, four, five, and six for today is all we're going to get through. Uh, my goal is to make it as close to 20 minutes as possible. I don't know if that's going to happen because I had a lot of housekeeping things in there. Uh, however, we'll start out with number four here. So we've been talking about Ronald Reagan, uh, talking about how he has been a conservative president. It's this rise of conservatism through the 1970s and leading to Ronald Reagan getting elected as president. So Reagan has this idea uh, specifically, we had talked about beforehand, we had talked about his economic stuff, if you remember. Um, we had talked about economic, social issues. Now let's talk about political, specifically foreign issues, issues with the rest of the world. Now, as you might recall, we are in the middle of a Cold War at this point. We have been in the Cold War since the end of World War One, or the end of World War Two. sorry, since like 1945, 1946, uh, all the way up until this point. And we're in the 1980s at this point, and we are 35 years into this Cold War, 35 plus years. So Ronald Reagan has this idea to try to get rid of the uh, Soviet Union once and for all, try to uh, force them to collapse and win the Cold War once and for all. Uh, his plan is uh, something that we call, or that he calls, peace through strength. Peace through strength. Uh, he wanted to raise military spending, that would be the strength, uh, in order to end the, United, or the uh, USSR, the Soviet Union. So he wanted to raise military spending, basically force the USSR to dissolve and to either raise their spending or give up. So they've either got to dump a lot of money into their military, money that they don't have at this point because they were pretty, uh, pretty down on their luck at this point, the Soviet Union was. So either they need to raise a lot of money and dump it into their military or they are going to give up. So we're kind of forcing their hand one way or another. So this is what we call peace through strength or what Reagan called peace through strength. Uh, they want peace, but the way that we're getting peace is by being very, very strong in, uh, in our military. So one of the uh, programs that was put in place by Ronald Reagan uh, was a very interesting one. It was, it was kind of just a plan. It got some traction, but it never fully came to, uh, came to being. Uh, and that would be uh, what is pictured here called the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Strategic Defense Initiative. I've also got it written up uh, here, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, the plan was for, uh, basically if the, United, if the uh, USSR shot missiles at the USA, us, America, if they shot missiles at us, nuclear missiles, we wanted to have a plan in place that we could shoot rockets at those missiles in order to shoot them down and make them explode before they hit us. Okay, so we're going to try to shoot rockets out of the air with other rockets, which is kind of cool. Uh, but a lot of people said, wait a second, 
that's not really possible. That can't actually happen. Uh, we can't actually, we, I mean, we're just at the point where we can accurately hit a target on the ground, not to mention one that's hitting, uh, not to mention one that's moving in the air at uh, really, really fast speeds and it's leaving the atmosphere and we've got to catch it at some point. Uh, so that part is a little tricky. Uh, now, as you may have noticed, I have a, in blue here, uh, it says Star Wars in parentheses. That is the nickname that a lot of people gave to the Strategic Defense Initiative, the SDI. They called it Star Wars in reference to the popular movies, uh, Star Wars. It seemed like something that was only possible in the movies that could happen. Uh, and so, so many, many people say, yeah, that's not going to happen. That's impossible. And to some extent, they were correct uh, because it never really gets off the ground in any large, uh, large capacity. Um, to my understanding, uh, even nowadays, we have issues shooting down rockets. We have about a 50% uh, success rate. So if we're aiming at a rocket, chances are one out of two, one out of every two rockets will hit with our rockets. Uh, but the other ones get missed. So yeah, uh, the the strategy here is not not the greatest. But uh, it is a it is an idea. Uh, they wanted to use lasers for this one, uh, strategic defense initiative. Sorry, I was saying rockets, but I forgot it was lasers. Uh, so shoot them down with lasers, which was something that uh, I don't know Star Wars was all about. So anyways, that's a plan to try to get rid of the Soviet Union and to try to protect us. Okay. Now there is also a plan uh, that is, uh, there's also a plan that is kind of put in place by the Soviet Union specifically, uh, and that plan would be called Glasnost, Glasnost. Uh, Glasnost is put in place by a Soviet leader and the leader of the Soviet Union during Reagan's time in office. His name is Mikhail Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev. So uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, he passes, or I guess implements, this idea of glasnost. Glasnost in Russian, I guess, uh, just means openness, openness, or a new openness, okay? By openness, it means that he is trying to reform the USSR, reform the Soviet Union from the inside out try to add in pieces of good things from other countries around the world that will make the Soviet Union successful. He says, you know, pure communism is not good for the Soviet Union. We need to start to add in other ideas. Okay, so he is trying to be a little bit more open in some cases about, uh, about the Soviet Union and their future. He does not view uh, communism really as a super sustainable, uh, super sustainable, uh, idea in, uh, in the Soviet Union. So Mikhail Gorbachev uh, creates Glasnost. Uh, basically the idea was is that, that the Soviets kind of saw, and this is an old saying, saw the writing on the wall. Okay, the writing on the wall is an old, uh, an old saying that just means you see what's going to happen before it actually happens. Uh, the writing on the wall tells me that I'm going to uh, eat lunch or whatever. Okay. Well, no. Okay. So imagine this. Okay. Imagine I'm, I'm sitting down here recording a video and I start smelling something upstairs and I'm like, Hmm, this is interesting. What could that smell be? And it's, it's a food that is cooking in the oven. Okay. I can see the writing on the wall that I'm going to have that food today. Okay. Cause that's cooking in the oven. So that's, I guess a horrible example of writing on the wall, but that's what it is. Uh, it's kind of like you see or you hear about something and it's going to happen eventually. It's just a matter of time when it does. Uh, the writing is on the wall. Uh, so that is, that is uh, I don't know, uh, what happens. Uh, so the writing on the wall here is that the Soviet Union is going to tank at some point and Gorbachev needs to start allowing some democratic ideas coming in. Uh, he also needs to understand that the United States is spending a lot of money to try to force the Soviet Union to fall. And uh, the Soviet Union is not going to be able to keep up with that. So the Soviet Union better, at some point or another, figure out what they're going to do when they fall. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, Gorbachev is trying to do here. Uh, he's trying to open up the Soviet Union to make it so that it can survive past uh, when the ultimate decision is made to move away from communism. 
so here's Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev up there in the top left. Now, Ronald Reagan, one of his most famous moments as president, comes in a speech that he gives in uh, West Berlin. Uh, remember, West Berlin had the Berlin Wall that was built all around it. Uh, the Berlin Wall was meant to keep people out of West Berlin, keep the East Germany folks out of West Berlin, because West Berlin, uh, according to the Soviets, they were the bad guys, they were the democratic people, uh, they were the, the rich people, the Westerners. Um, now, Ronald Reagan goes to West Berlin in uh, 1988. Yeah, 1988. And he basically, uh, he gives this this very inspiring speech. Uh, I actually, if we were in class right now, I would show you uh, a snippet of the speech. I've got it all ready right here to go, but I don't think I can play this and have YouTube keep my video up. I think it's going to take it down if I link this video in there because it'll get uh, flagged for copyright something or other. So I can't show this to you, but I would, what I would do is I would go onto YouTube right now uh, and uh, search Ronald Reagan Berlin Wall. Ronald Reagan Berlin Wall or Reagan Berlin Wall. Watch, uh, there should be a video there. Uh, this video is, uh, how long is this video? Two minutes. Uh, so find a video, two, three minutes, and it'll show you a very strong snippet of, of what he is saying. Okay, so his, uh, his video here, specifically at the Berlin Wall, uh, he's got a very, very famous line. He talks about, how, uh, talks about how the Soviets either need to decide to open up for good or they need to, uh, they basically, it's time for them to more or less put up or shut up. Uh, they need to either double down on communism or they need to finally take the steps to end, uh, end communism in their country. And he views the big symbol of communism, at least in terms of Europe, is this Berlin Wall. So he says there is a sign that would be unmistakable if Gorbachev is serious about opening up his country. He needs to uh, tear down the Berlin Wall. So he's got this very, very famous line in which he says, quote, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And he, everybody just goes nuts. Okay, everybody goes crazy. So I would encourage you, watch that clip. Okay, I'm going to move on right now, but pause the video. Uh, watch that little clip, okay, two, three minutes, whatever it is, just go on YouTube and watch it, and then I'll continue on. So come back here after you've done that. Okay, hopefully you've done that. Okay, I'm moving on. Uh, so moving on to uh, number five. After Reagan gives his speech at the Berlin Wall uh, in 1988, uh, there is a change of events that starts happening in, uh, in Europe. All of a sudden, one year later, the Berlin Wall is torn down. Okay, the, uh, the people in Germany, but also, uh, also uh, East Germany, they decide that they're going to tear down this wall. Okay, so the Soviets kind of take, uh, take the idea there. Um, so they tear down the wall, uh, open up Germany, and Germany ends up uh, reunifying. So remember, there was East Germany and West Germany that was kind of divided during this Cold War. There was East Berlin and West Berlin. Uh, these two sides uh, come together in 1991 into kind of a fully unified Germany, uh, not West Germany, not East Germany anymore. It's Germany. So uh, as that stands, Germany's reunified in 1991. That was the year I was born. Okay. Uh, and also communists start to kind of lose power across Europe. Uh, which then leads to uh, a bunch of different countries declaring their independence and moving away from communism. So there were a bunch of countries that were uh, that were communist, uh, like Poland, like East Germany, like Yugoslavia, uh, a bunch of countries that were communist that then move away from communism in 1989, 1990, 1991. Uh, those those few years right after the Cold War is over, or right as the Cold War is is kind of wrapping up. Now, the final domino to fall is the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union ends up falling and breaking apart in 1991. So again, the year I was born, Soviet Union falls. Uh, so I have not been, because I was born at the very end of 1991, I have not been alive since the Soviet Union was a thing. Because uh, it fell, I was born December 30th. So it was uh, before that, because I was not the last day of the year. So the Soviet Union falls in 1991. They break up into 
uh, 15 different countries. So the Soviet Union had had gotten a bunch of other countries that it kind of grabbed. Uh, think of it as like a magnet. Uh, it pulls in these other countries as part of the Soviet Union. Uh, so all at the at the time the Soviet Union breaks up, basically all of those uh, all of those little pieces get to become their own country. Okay, get to become their own thing. Uh, the biggest piece is a country that we know of as Russia, which we have heard of before. But Russia becomes the biggest piece of the Soviet, or the biggest piece of the former Soviet Union. Uh, oftentimes, we use those two things interchangeably. But the Soviet Union had more territory than Russia did, but it was kind of the same people for the most part. So. Uh, the Soviet Union falls, like I said. Now, who gets credit for this? Who is responsible for uh, this Soviet Union falling and the ending of the Cold War? Uh, two people get credit for this. Uh, one of them, Mikhail Gorbachev, okay, the Soviet premier, who said, or they say, okay, he opened up Russia, he op or he opened up the Soviet Union, and then it allowed uh, the Soviet Union to implement some democratic things and it allowed for communism to ultimately end in the Soviet Union. So that's the first person that gets credit. The second person is our president, Ronald Reagan, who gets credit for this. Uh, even though the Soviet Union fell after Ronald Reagan was done being president, Ronald Reagan still had strong actions that uh, led the Soviet Union, kind of forced their hand and forced them to make these tough decisions about Glasnost and about uh, ending uh, their rule of communism. So both of those guys, Gorbachev uh, and Reagan, both of them are responsible for bringing about the end of this Soviet Union. So uh, that's, that's good. Uh, so here you've got a couple pictures of the Berlin Wall coming down. This guy is going to town with what looks like a sledgehammer and it is all rainy. So it makes for a very, very uh, dramatic photo. Um, and then over here, they are uh, kind of uh, pushing down big sections of this wall, uh, brick by br or piece by piece. Now here you've got here, I should have shown you this, uh, all of these countries that are colored anything but this grayish color that surrounds the map, uh, all of these pieces were part of, uh, part of the, uh, yeah, part of the Soviet Union. So 15 different countries, and the biggest one being Russia here. Okay, but all of these were little parts, and so the fringes kind of get broken off into uh, into Russia. So that part's kind of, uh, or broken off into their own countries away from Russia. So that part's kind of, uh, kind of interesting and uh, kind of good, I guess. That is good if you're opposed to communism, which uh, most of us are self-respecting Americans and probably are. Uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying there. Uh, number six, uh, Iran-Contra affair. Uh, there is a scandal that breaks out during Ronald Reagan's presidency, and that scandal would be the Iran-Contra affair. Okay, it breaks out in the late 1980s with the Iran-Contra affair. Now, uh, this is a little confusing, so I will do my best to explain it. Uh, we are dealing with two different groups of people. Okay, one group of people would be Iran. Iran is a country uh, that is in, uh, Iran is just south of these other places, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Iran's down there in uh, the Middle East. Iran happens to be a um, questionable country towards us nowadays uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of our dealings with them in 2020. But um, at this time, we're, we're not necessarily opposed to Iran, uh, so we kind of want to help out Iran a little bit. Uh, they are helping out uh, terrorists, or they're not helping out terrorists, they're fighting back against terrorists in the Middle East. So we want to help them out a little bit. Um, now, or I guess we want them to help us out a little bit fighting against terrorists. So we're trying to get them to partner with us. Now also, we are trying to help out a group of uh, a group of revolutionaries, I guess, or not not revolutionaries, they are what they would call counter-revolutionaries, meaning that they are opposing a revolution. And these people would be called the Contras, okay, the Contras. The Contras were from a country down in South America called Nicaragua, Nicaragua. 
Uh, so Nicaragua is the country where the Contras are from. Now, there is a revolution that's happening in Nicaragua, and Reagan and the rest of America in general doesn't like the revolution. It would be a... Um, I'm not sure if they were communist or not, but we didn't like them, okay? We did not like their leaders and all that. So we are trying to uh, help the Contras kick out this revolution or to snuff out this revolution. So what do we do? Uh, Ronald Reagan says, hey, can we give money to uh, the Contras to help them out in their fight against this revolution in Nicaragua? And Congress says, no, you cannot. Uh, and the American people are kind of questioning, yeah, should we, should we not? Not sure. So Congress says no. So uh, what Reagan does is, well, not necessarily Reagan. What Reagan's administration does is gives money, uh, or not gives money, sells weapons to Iran, okay, because we wanted their help in fighting these terrorists in the Middle East. So we give weapon, or we don't give them, we sell weapons to Iran. Uh, we give them a lot of good stuff, and they pay us in return, and they would then use that uh, those weapons to fight back against terrorism. So we're trying to be their friends. So we sell them this stuff. And then what we do with the money is, and this is Reagan's administration, or people in Reagan's administration, they then turn around and use that money that they had gotten from those weapon sales uh, to then push straight to the Contras in Nicaragua. So we then give money from the weapon sales to the Contras in order to get them to fight back against the revolution that is in Nicaragua. So, like I said, Congress didn't allow uh, the president and those uh, the administration to give money to the Contras. So Congress doesn't like this. So what do we end up with? Uh, we end up with kind of a under the table sort of deal where Congress doesn't really authorize this weapons trade, but weapons get traded. And then that money that is kind of dirty money at this point then gets sent to Nicaragua to the Contras. So all of this kind of blows up in the late 1980s when Reagan is kind of uh, dealing with his second term as president. Uh, Reagan deals with, uh, with this pretty well. Uh, Reagan says, you know what, uh, this happened under my watch. I did not know about it. Okay, he says, I didn't know about it. I didn't order this. I didn't oversee all this. People did it that I had trusted with my, uh, with my, or with my power, whatever. Uh, but I didn't know anything about it. But I accept responsibility. That's what Ronald Reagan says. He says, I'm sorry, I should have known, or I should have stopped this if I'd have known about it. So he accepted a responsibility for it. Now, uh, what then happens is, uh, there is a specific guy, uh, this guy that's pictured here, uh, this military general, his name is Oliver North. Uh, Oliver North, he is uh, at one point uh, recently, I don't know if he still is, but at one point he was the head of the NRA, the National Riflemen's Association. Uh, but uh, at this point he's a, uh, not a, I don't know if he's a general, I think he's a corporal or something. Um, Anyways, Oliver North, he kind of takes the fall for this. He's the guy who oversaw this whole weapons trade and then facilitated the dealings with Nicaragua and with Contras. So Reagan gets off basically clean on this whole thing because he said, you know what, I should have taken responsibility. I should have done it. So I would say uh, that whenever you're faced with a struggle, admit that you might have made a mistake and usually it ends up better for you in the long run. That's just a life lesson in general. Uh, so or Reagan gets the nickname, uh, the Teflon president, the Teflon president. Uh, now, if you, uh, if you know what Teflon is, it is a uh, material that uh, oftentimes is used in cookware, uh, specifically non-stick cookware. Uh, if you have a cook, uh, like a pot or a pan that is meant so that it's non-stick, most of the time it's coated in Teflon. Teflon's this material that nothing sticks to it. It's it's uh, slippery. Nothing sticks to it. So Nixon, or not Nixon, that'd be annoying uh, to get compared to Nixon. That'd be frustrating. Uh, Reagan gets nicknamed the Teflon president because nothing sticks to him. He's just a good guy and nothing that people say is actually going to stick to him. So even though he might have had some oversight role in this Iran-Contra affair, nothing sticks to him and he gets kind of celebrated as, uh, as a really good president by a lot of people. So um, 
yeah, that's kind of where we have to have to leave off with ne or with uh, Reagan. Now, Reagan, sad story here. Uh, Reagan, towards the end of his presidency, starts to deal with a little bit of memory loss. Uh, he ends up with dementia, uh, which is, you know, you start forgetting things. And part of, a lot of people think that he actually might have known something about this Iran-Contra affair, but just forgot legitimately because he had dementia. Uh, shortly after he becomes, uh, or after he uh, gets done being president, he was done in 1989, uh, which we'll talk about tomorrow with George H.W. Bush coming into power. Uh, when Reagan is done being president, uh, he, I don't know how very quickly, but he quickly kind of descends into uh, forgetting a lot of things, and he ends up dying uh, a handful of years later uh, from dementia. So it's kind of a sad story uh, for a president. He did not live very long afterwards. A lot of presidents live a very long time after being president. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, president before Ronald Reagan, is actually still alive. He's like 95 or 96. Uh, so presidents have a tendency to live very long lives. But uh, Reagan, he was already pretty old when he became president. Uh, he was in his 70s uh, when he was president. Uh, and so he... Um, he quickly declined after being president and uh, died, not immediately, but a handful of years later from dementia. So uh, that's kind of a, a sad end to the Ronald Reagan story. But uh, for a lot of people, very celebrated guy, very celebrated leader uh, based on his strong leadership in ending the Cold War and also uh, strong conservative values. So conservatives happen to like him a lot. Um, liberal people, not so much, but they respect him, at least for the most part. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, you can like a, or you can respect a person, but still disagree with their policies. That's uh, generally what I would say about that. Uh, and that goes for both sides. A lot of people do, uh, conservatives and liberals, Democrats and Republicans. So uh, I totally missed my mark of doing 20 minutes. I am now 11 minutes past that. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. But this stuff is like fresh and it gets interesting. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, George H.W. Bush and we are going to talk about Bill Clinton and Clinton's impeachment, uh, which has to do with his uh, sexual affair scandal. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. So uh, make sure you come back for that tomorrow. Uh, and so we will be done there. Uh, I've got a couple questions for you guys to answer. So go ahead and work on those uh, right now. Again, I apologize immensely for this being uh, lengthier than usual. Uh, and I will do better tomorrow. I will try to at least. Okay. I'm trying my best here. So I will see you guys back again tomorrow and take care. Stay, stay safe. And if you got sunburn, use some aloe. It helps. I didn't have to for mine, but use it. It's good. So I'll see you guys tomorrow.